go ahead and get started. Uh, cell phones away. It'd be great. Thank you. I got it. Uh, this is Dr. Schusler. He's going to talk to us about security uh, and a little bit about Tarleton State, where he is a professor. So, there you go. Thank you very much. Uh, as I said, my name is Dr. Schusler. I'm a professor at Tarleton State University. Anybody heard of Tarleton State? Know where it's at? Yes. Haven't heard of it. Probably don't know where it's at. It's uh, southwest of Fort Worth. About 70 miles, 68 miles, something like that. Uh, it's a relatively small school, about 10,000 students. We'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Um, when I start my classes at the beginning of each semester, I usually try to give my students a little bit of background about myself. I always like to know, when I was a student, I always like to know a little bit about my professors and who was giving me, who was giving me my grades and things like that. So I decided I'd start off today talking about that. I grew up here in Denton. I was actually born in Oklahoma. Uh, when my dad was there, when I was about six months old, my dad moved down here to go to North Texas State University, it's now North, uh, the University of North Texas. Um, so I've been here pretty much all my life. My dad's from Texas, and my mom's from Oklahoma. So Texas OU weekends were a lot of fun at my, my parents' house. And uh, actually, my mom would be in one room, my dad would be in the other. It was not for the same team. Uh, I went to Jennings Elementary, Strickland Junior High, Denton High School. When I went to high school here. It was the only high school. There was no Ryan. There was no Guyer. Um, so that's if you went to high school, that's where you went to high school. I went to North Texas. I actually went to UT Arlington for one year. And like most students, you kind of like to move away, get away from home. That's what I did. That's what I wanted to do. I went to that UT Arlington for one year. And I really liked it. I, I'm, I'm used to it. I knew where everything was. I, I just, it was a lot more fun and different for me. So I ended up moving back to North Texas. And I went to school in North Texas for an awfully long time. I've got four degrees, a bachelor's in, 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 in uh, business administration, an MBA in business computer information systems, an MS in information technology, and a PhD in business computer information systems. In total, that took me about 20 years in college, 21 in UTR. So I went to school for a really long time. Uh, I've got three certifications, A plus certified, network plus certified, and security plus certified. They're all entry level certifications. When I say they're entry level, you really start off with A plus, and then network plus and security plus come after that. But they're really all entry level certifications. I highly recommend that you start out with those and you, you advance and, and obtain some of the higher level certifications. I would like to do that myself. I just, as a professor, I simply don't have the time. Eventually, I'll get back to, to getting certifications. I just, like I said, I haven't had the time. Ultimately, virtually everybody's going to go to college at some point. Some of you will graduate, some of you won't. That's just the nature of, of going to college. Uh, but the reality is, is, for those that go on and graduate and get out of school, there's a lot of other students that are doing exactly that same thing. So I really recommend getting a certification or two or three on top of your degree. So don't think of them as being separate. Think of them as being together, putting those two together. You've got to distinguish yourself from those that are around you, and you can do that with certifications. So I definitely recommend that. Tarleton promotes that pretty heavily as well. A lot of their classes are geared around certifications, like A plus, network plus, security plus. Um, so I, I think it provides students with a lot of value. Uh, as I said, I'm a professor at Tarleton State. I have my personal website. You probably can't see it. It's down there at the very bottom. Um, if you want to check, check out my uh, website, there's, there's information there about some of the classes that I teach, projects that, that uh, we do in class, and things like that. And I have a YouTube channel as well. Um, that's where I post. I videotape lectures, and I post them there, mostly for my online students. I have face-to-face -face classes, uh, as well as online classes. The online classes obviously don't have the benefit of a lecture, so if I can videotape those lectures, I can post them to YouTube, and I would go online classes have that, that benefit if they want to use it. They don't have to, obviously, but it is an option. <laughs> it's not a promotional video from the college. I'll show that and talk more about the technology. So we're going to Texas and go to Charleston.
little comparison between Tarleton and North Texas. I, I think yeah, there are different types of schools. Um, obviously, I have a, a, a lot of positive things to say about North Texas. I went there for a long time. But I'm a professor at Tarleton State. And so I wanted to kind of give you guys a, 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 a perspective of what, how they're similar and how they're different. Tarleton formed and founded in 1899. It's actually part of the Texas A&M system. A lot of people don't know that. They assume it's just some state, state college out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, is formed in 1890 or founded in 1899, part of the AM system. They kept the Tarleton name because back in, was it 1917 when they, they joined the AM system, John Tarleton was the founder and he decided that he wanted to maintain that name in as part of the university. So he did not want to take on the AM moniker. Uh, nevertheless, it is part of the AM system, so it's just like AM at Commerce or AM at College Station or AM at a variety of other uh, locations or campuses as well. Uh, depending on the source that you read, they have a student-to-faculty ratio of around 18 to 20 to 1. So it's a little bit better than North Texas. One of the things that I like about Tarleton is the class sizes are relatively small. The campus is relatively small, for one or 10,000 students. The advantage to that is you kind of, it's relatively easy to be familiar with the campus. It's relatively easy to run into your friends around campus. I went to school with my wife at North Texas, and I didn't know she was there. I didn't. I never saw her. Uh, so it's something that happens in as big of a, a university as North, uh, that North Texas is. Cost, according to U.S. News, Carlton's about half the price of North Texas. We've got two students in North Texas right now in my life. It's expensive. It costs a lot of money. Is it a good school? Absolutely. But bear in mind, it, it does cost quite a bit. Carlton's price range, roughly in the range of what a community college might cost bit more. It's not a community college, it's a, it's a university, but it's significantly cheaper than, than North Texas. The graduation rate, six-year graduation rate, 67% in Tarleton versus 48% in North Texas. Because it's a smaller university, you see professors more face in more of a face-to-face -face environment than you might in North Texas. You tend to see more higher graduation rates, and that's, that's a good thing, obviously. Uh, six years, that sounds like a long time. The reality is, is most students do not graduate in four years. Can you? Yes. Uh, for my undergrad, it took me six and a half years. So it's not unusual for you to take four, five, even six years. Uh, so don't be discouraged if it, if it takes you longer than four years. Uh, if you've got things like uh, AP classes, you've got dual credit classes, you've got things that you can test out, you can speed up that process significantly. My daughter pretty much started as a sophomore, so uh, it's, it's, you need a lot of credit hours if, if you're taking advantage of some of that. How many seniors do we have here? Do you? Okay. You guys plan on going to school somewhere? Stuff lined up. Be sure and fill out your FAFSA if you haven't already. You guys all done that? Be sure and do that. Take advantage of every single penny you can get. It's especially if you're going to North Texas. It's expensive. And this is just tuition and I believe books. It's not including anything like housing or any other kind of expenses or anything like that. That obviously would cost quite a bit more. Uh, acceptance rates uh, and SAT scores are, are there at the bottom, not quite as good at Carlton. So read into that what you will. Uh, it, it's not, it's probably not quite as good of a, a university as North Texas is as a whole. There are certain programs that I think probably are a little bit better, but that really varies from program to program. Any, uh, let's go ahead and go through this first. Um, anybody know the difference between, say, computer science and information system? It's a confusing topic, and a lot of times when I've seen parents come to school with, with, with their, their kids looking at a university, they get confused about the two. They just automatically assume if it's computers, it's computer science. And that's really not true. There's information systems, which oftentimes is located in the College of Business, and then there's the computer science, which oftentimes is housed inside the College of, of Engineering uh, and places like that. Computer science tends to be more theoretically based. They talk about creating programming languages, for example. They talk about how to design memory, um, how to design a microprocessor, as opposed to applying all those concepts in some kind of an organizational setting. That's what information systems is about. It's looking at hardware and looking at software and saying, what can we do with that for our organization? How can we make more money from that? How can we get more customers? How can we be more efficient? That's what information systems about, is applying that technology in 
some kind of an organizational setting. At Tarleton, we basically have, or I work in the CIS department, we basically have the Computer Information Systems Department. We basically have two tracks within that department. We have a programming track and we have a, a networking track. I'm not really into programming. It's not something I really enjoy all that much. I think it's something that's very valuable. So if that's your area, that's great. I think it really helps feed into a lot of other areas. Um, so I don't want to disparage anybody from, from looking at the programming side of things. But my interest is really more in the, in the area of networking. Uh, as far as programming at Tarleton, they have several different languages that they teach. They teach, teach C Sharp, they teach Java. Believe it or not, they actually teach COBOL uh, as an elective. And if that's your area, I would highly recommend you learn something like COBOL. It, it really comes down to a supply and demand issue. There's not a lot of people that know COBOL. There's a lot of corporations that have a lot of data stored in COBOL. What does that mean? those programmers are worth a lot more money. There's a lot of people with no job that are programmers probably aren't worth as much. So from a money perspective, even though COBOL is not nearly as glamorous as C Sharp or, or uh, Java, COBOL is really a valuable language to learn. On the networking side of things, most of the classes that I teach are graduate level classes. So I don't teach a lot of these. I teach the, at the graduate level for the most part. I have, however, taught this talk on the CIS uh, 347 data communications. Um, we have a lot of courses that are designed for dairy, various aspects of networking. And Mr. Deering teaches most of these classes. And they're different aspects of networking, different uh, design projects that you create throughout the, the, your coursework. And you have a lot of flexibility about which courses you need to take versus which courses you have to take. So you know, you've got a lot of opportunity to, to take classes there uh, if that's something you're interested in. Something we have specifically for students at, at Tarleton that uh, um, other, other campuses might have, might or might not, depending on, on their, uh, their curriculum, we have a, an AITP local chapter. AITP is the Association for Information Technology Professionals. And what that means to you is it's basically a student organization that you can join, and they will periodically go out to various vendors. For example, this last semester we went to the Microsoft campus in Tepel. Got a tour of the facility. It's a really nice facility. Got to check out their various offices, the various uh, departments that they have inside the organization. One of the things that I thought was the most interesting was in their cafeteria they have a Coke machine. And it's not a Coke machine like you've ever seen. It's a, you know, it's a, a small box. It's got a graphical display on it. You pick whatever drink that you want on it. And then as you drill down, it's a touch screen uh, machine. As you drill down, you get to pick the various flavors that you want. So you want to add vanilla cherry, all those types of things. And it's a touch screen device. It all comes out of one spout. So I thought that was really pretty cool. But you know, I, I like stuff like that. Um, they visit local recruiters. One of the other things that they did this semester, they went to Robert Half, which is an employment agency. Talked to them about how to work on their resumes, things that they can do to spice up their resume, make their resume look a little bit better, make them more hireable as, as students once they graduate. Uh, they also have the AITP conference. That conference is something that they go to at the state, regional, and national level. And what that conference is basically is an opportunity for students to go and compete in various various areas. They have database competitions, network competitions, programming competitions, where basically various teams from universities are presented with a problem and they have to design and develop some kind of solution. If you win that competition, the higher up, the higher you finish, more likely you are to win cash award. So you can actually not only receive first, second, third place, if you can plan it and actually get money out of the whole thing. So obviously that, that helps pay for a little bit of the way of schooling and things like that. Uh, there's also the Microsoft Academic Alliance that, that uh, the CIS department is, is a, uh, a member of or a, a partner with. You have that opportunity at, at a lot of universities. There's a lot of departments that belong to that. Uh, so it's not something that's necessarily unique to us. Wherever you go, be sure to ask about that. Because what that means to you as students is free software, free Microsoft software. Not necessarily Microsoft Office. That's not available specifically. The Microsoft Project is. Microsoft Visio is. Um, uh, Visual Studios is part of that. Windows Server, Windows 7. All of those are, are software packages that are available from that. Once you register in one of our pro one of our classes, after the add drop period, you're automatically sent an email with login information. You can log in, you can 
download the ISO and you can install it on your own system. It doesn't cost anything. That's part of the benefit of being, being in one of those classes. So be sure wherever you go, if they're part of the Microsoft Academic Alliance, be sure to ask about that. Okay. So any questions about Tarleton, college, anything like that? Okay. The next thing I wanted to do at the beginning of the semester when I start out the class, in addition to introducing myself, talking about who I am, what my background is, all that type of stuff, I try to give the students a feel for how fast things change, the speed, the, the pace of change that's occurring. If you're interested in computers, you're probably pretty familiar with that. You look at old people and say, yeah, they can't keep up, they don't understand how fast things change. That's true. Now, first off, let me back up for just a second. The Internet's been around a lot longer than it's been around longer than, than me, so um, those old people really kind of set the foundation for a lot of the technology that we have today. Having said that, though, I, the video that I'm about to show, I think, really kind of illustrates just how fast things really are changing. So let's take a look at this.
something you used to hear in the IT field a lot uh, a few years back of, of your jobs being shipped overseas. The reality is there's plenty of jobs here. Before he died, Steve Jobs told Barack Obama that he could hire 30,000 engineers almost immediately at his plant in Cupertino, California. The problem was there weren't 30,000 engineers to be hired um, in this country. So the idea is that to be able to protect yourself from those types of situations, to be able to protect yourself from jobs being outsourced, You've got to continually educate yourself. You've got to continually maintain those certifications and advance your understanding of the field that's around you. That's the best way to protect yourself from those, those types of issues. Um, when I was asked to come speak, they, you know, I talked to them about what would be interesting and what's, what's a topic that's interesting. And security was one of the things that came up, and which I think is great. It's one of the areas that I like. I like networking. I like security. Those are areas that I think are particularly interesting. Um, so this is kind of a hodgepodge of various security topics that, um, that you might run across. There's a lot more depth that you go into in, in a lot of them, but uh, I'm trying to touch on, on, on several different ones in today's lecture. So what is information system security? What do you think of when you hear information system security? Protecting your information. Information, protecting that information. What else? about your hardware. The data is an important one. That's one people usually overlook. People normally think of hardware. They don't think about their data. Information system security means protecting information and information systems from unauthorized access. So if you're not supposed to have access, you don't get access in, in a secure system. Unauthorized use, unauthorized disclosure, so no TJ Maxx breaches type uh, uh, things. Disruption, so when you want access to your data or your hardware, you have access to it. That, that access is not disrupted, such as a denial of service attack or something like that. Modification, perusal, etc., etc. Computer security, network security, and information security are all terms that oftentimes get used interchangeably. Does that mean they're the same thing? No, not really. But a lot of times the, the distinctions are so subtle, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to, to you know, worry about that too much. So when you hear one of those terms, for the most part, it's pretty much what, you think, what you're thinking about when you think about information system security. Threats create risk which is mitigated through the use of countermeasures. What are threats? Give me some examples of threats. Viruses. Viruses, that's a big one. Hackers. Hackers. There's lots of threats. We like to talk about hackers. We like to talk about viruses. When you watch a, 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 any kind of a movie that talks about computer security, that's what you always hear because it's the most glamorous. It's the stuff that people really get into. But the reality is, is there are a lot of other threats that are out there. Natural disasters, for example, fires, hurricanes, floods. Computers don't like water very much. It's just they don't get along very well. Uh, if you have a water-cooled system, that's cool. But for the most part, computers don't get along with, with water. Uh, the point is, is, there's a lot of other threats that are out there. Technical obsolescence. Hard drives are mechanical devices unless you have a solid state drive. That means there's bearings inside that disk as that, as that, that fighter spins. Those bearings are going to wear out. Therefore, that hard drive is going to fail. It may take a few years, but it's going to fail. It's not if, it's when. So those types of things are all, all represent different threats that your system might face. Um, so those threats create a risk. They create a risk that you might lose your hardware. They create a risk that you might lose your data. So those are some risks that you face. And we use countermeasures to try to mitigate that risk. What does that mean? It means control that risk in some fashion. We back up our data. We have a redundant power supply in our computer to make sure that it continues to run if the primary power supply fails. Same thing with hard drives, things like that. Okay, so I threw up a really messy model to kind of illustrate that. Um, threats up here in the top left. We throw up various countermeasures, things like detection. We, we check our logs periodically to see if somebody's been accessing our system. Uh, prevention efforts. We use a password or something like that to protect our system. Our deterrence. When you guys log in, is there a screen that says you will not use our system inappropriately or anything like that? There should be. And there should be a use, an acceptable use policy that serves as a deterrent that says if you use our system inappropriately, you could be fired, suspended, tarred and feathered, or whatever. And then ultimately, you hope to increase your information system security effectiveness by applying those various countermeasure efforts. 
So what are the, the top threats that we face? Well, deliberate software attacks, viruses, malware, those types of things, those are the things that, that most system administrators are worried about. That's the, what most of them worry about. Technical hardware failures, again, those hard drives physically are going to fail. You're going to get a spike in the load that's going to cause a network card to go down or cause your, your power supply to fail. Acts of human error or failure, people drop stuff. They accidentally leave a, uh, a tape backup in the, in the backseat of their car. It's stolen. Forces of nature is a pretty high one. It's number four. This list is actually much longer. Uh, obviously, I couldn't fit it all on, on one screen. The forces of nature, so those floods, those fires that we were talking about, system administrators are worried about that type of stuff. It, it does happen. So to talk about security, we really have to have a pretty fundamental understanding of what some of the central tenets of security are. And there's a lot of them, but some of the ones that I, I chose to talk about were defense in depth, the CIA triangle, and the AAA of security. And that's what the next several slides are talking about, is each one of these. In a very traditional sense, uh, defense in depth refers to having multiple layers of security. The idea behind it being that we're not going to be able to catch every threat with a specific countermeasure. We've got to have multiple countermeasures to be able to stop a threat because threats are dynamic. They change over time. They figure out ways around our countermeasures. So in a traditional sense, you might have a, a, a castle that's pr pr uh, protected by a mot, it's protected by a moat, it's pr protected by curtain walls. So we've got several layers of defense to help protect the people inside of the castle from people outside of the castle. More, in a more contemporary setting, you might look at the TSA when you go to the airport. What happens when you go to the airport? You get asked for your ID at the ticket counter. They want to make sure that you've actually purchased a ticket before they, they start talking to you and giving up information about flights and all that type of stuff. They're going to scan your checked baggage, regardless of, of whether or not they physically go through it. They're going to, at the very least, scan it. After that, if they see anything interesting or maybe perhaps at random, they're physically going to check it. They're going to open it up and go through your stuff. And it's certainly a possibility. In the security line, they're going to ask you for your ID again. That's where they're going to pull out that little blue light, look at your ID, try to make sure that it's not a forgery or anything like that. Uh, so they're going to start looking at you in a little bit more depth. So they've got multiple different layers, the idea being that at some layer, they're hopefully going to catch you, but that some layer is going to be able to catch wrongdoers. Any questions on that? Okay, CIA triangle. Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality says that if we're going to talk to each other, if we're going to communicate via email, or we've got a session going on between a, a web browser and a web server, that we only want that, that communication to occur between the, int the intended parties. In other words, if somebody else wants to listen in, they can't if, we, if we're maintaining confidentiality. So confidentiality says that, that only the people that are involved in that communication or should be involved in that communication are the ones that actually are in, in, involved in that communication. Integrity says that whatever we put into that communication really is what we get out of it. In other words, that there's not somebody in the middle that intercepts our communication and modifies it in some way and then sends it on to its destination. Why? Because the person on the receiving end believes that to be a genuine message. So if we fail to have integrity, that message can be modified. So we want to make sure that we have integrity in our communications. And then availability, that we have access to our systems, to our data, when, where, and how we want in other words, we don't have to be at a specific place. We don't have to, to wait for a period of time to be able to access our information. If we've got availability, we should have access to it. That's what denial of services is about, is denying that availability. And the last one, the AAA model that I was going to talk about, was authentication, authorization, and accounting. On the Internet, no one knows you're a dog. That's what authentication is about. Authentication is to make sure you really are talking to a person that you want to talk to, that you're not talking to a dog on the other end of, the, other end of your communication. So authentication is verifying that a user is who they really claim to be. Without authentication, you can't have authorization. Authorization says, we've identified who this person is, what are we going to allow them to do? Can they create a file in that particular folder? Can they delete a file in that folder? Can they modify it? If you can't authenticate them, you can't begin to authorize them. That or you just open it up so that they can do everything and give them full access. And that's, that's not a good idea either. So you need to authenticate your users first, even if it's just a guest account. 
And then lastly, you have to have some way of documenting what's occurring. When are files being created? Who's doing it? When, how are they doing it? From where? Et cetera. So those, that's the AAA model. Authentication, authorization, and accounting. So the countermeasures that we're going to put in place to help protect our systems from the various threats that exist, the top ones, password policy, and if you'll notice a little bit further down, use of passwords. There's a distinction between those two. When I was talking to the various system administrators, they drew a distinction between a password policy versus the simple use of a password. Anybody want to take a stab at what we're talking about when we say password policy? The actual way it all passwords are designed. Exactly. So uppercase and lowercase, and special characters, the length, uh, how often it has to be changed. Sy uh, system administrators are starting to see that, that passwords are distinct from their password policy, and that in order to increase security, not only do we have to simply have passwords, which everybody takes for granted, we also have to have a password policy that's going to do exactly what you're saying, increase the, the uh, length of the password, mandate that there be certain, a, a certain strength to that password, a mandate that it be changed periodically. Uh, physical area security. If somebody physically walks off with your equipment, you're really in trouble. Uh, even if you've got your, your equipment password protected, if somebody removes your hard drive or somebody boots to a Linux disk, Linux doesn't recognize Windows security. Windows security means nothing to Linux, so they, they have access at that point to everything that's on that system. Uh, even if it happens to be encrypted, you really give up a lot of the, a lot of your, your your ability to protect your data, especially depending on the strength of the encryption that you have to be using. Uh, employee education is always a big one and has been for a long time because it's cheap. It's easy to educate employees. If you periodically have a re uh, a retraining session, not so necessarily to train employees, but simply to remind them, hey, don't write your password down and put it on your monitor. It's a bad idea. If you remind employees periodically about stuff like that, they're more likely to comply. If you don't, they're more likely to write it down and, and take it to their monitor. So, uh, and then there's a variety of other countermeasures. So, when it comes to authentication, we've talked about what authentication is. What are the three ways that we normally authenticate? What's the first way that we, we normally authenticate? The way we, we normally do. Username and password, by far the most common. It's what you know. You memorize the username, you memorize your password, that's what you use. Another one is, what do you have? So some kind of a token. Your debit card is a really good example if you have a debit card. You go to the bank, you have to have your debit card to put it into the ATM to get cash out. If you don't have your debit card, your PIN doesn't do you any good. You've got to have that debit card. So some kind of, some kind of token. And then what you are, biometrics, a thumbprint, a retina scan, facial recognition, hand geometry, a lot of different types of, of biometric devices that exist, but something that, that uh, oftentimes is seen as being a little bit better than, than uh, either of the prior two. What are the strengths of passwords? Why do we prefer the use of, of usernames and passwords? What's good about them? What's the downside to them? You can forget them. You can forget them. You can share them. Yeah. They might not be complex. I used to work at a health desk at North Texas, and I had a professor that gave me his password. And I was trying to help him out on the system. So that was a no-no right there. Another no-no was his password was his wife's first name. And it's a weak password, and he shared it with me. So, yeah, users are familiar with their use, administrators are familiar with their use, so it doesn't take a lot of training to use a username and password. Everybody knows how to do it. It's cheap to implement. Almost every application has a username and password mechanism built into it. Not all of them, obviously, but, but a lot of them do. On the weakness side, users often choose simple passwords. They write them down, they put it on a little sticky note, you know, tape it to their monitor, they put it under their keyboard, things like that. Users often use the same password for multiple systems. That's a violation of, of a good security practice. You really should have a different password for each system. Of course, that, that is harder to remember. Uh, they can easily be shared, and they can be forgotten. What about tokens? What are the strengths of a token? Can you share it? Yeah. 
share the token? No. You can, but unlike a password where you can share it over and over and over again, if you share that token, they can access the system, but you can't anymore. So it really limits access to the system to the person with that particular token. Um, so the token, ha token has to be present. It's more difficult to share. Token systems often use multi-factor authentication. Going back to your example of an ATM card, put it into the, the, uh, into the ATM machine. You physically have to have that token in the ATM card, but you also have to have that PIN, kind of like a password. So it's a multi-factor authentication, so you have an increased level of security when you combine it with more than one type of authentication. Unfortunately, it costs more to implement. You have to have the token itself. Those cards cost money. In some cases, you have to have a special reader for that token. So some, some the expenses can, can go up. If you lose it, it's easy to replace the password, right? You simply reset it and get a new password. But a token can be lost. That obviously increases the expense as well. What about biometrics? What's the strength of biometrics? What's the strength of biometrics? Only you have that. You can't, like, you can't share it all over. You hope. You hope you don't lose your thumb or face you or whatever. Um, I'm not going to say it can't happen, but you know, you just let's go with that. Uh, usually provides a very strong security, particularly when combined with others. Again, combine it with username and password with a retina scan or a thumbprint or something like that, and you should be in, in, in really good shape. Unfortunately, the readers for those types of devices, especially when you get into retina scanners or facial recognition, the ones that tend to be better cost quite a bit more, so the expense could be up. Users oftentimes aren't familiar with, and especially with older users, aren't really comfortable with biometric system. They don't like the fact that there's a scanner taking a, a scan of their face, or that there's an electronic copy of their thumbprint. So they don't like the idea of, of that. Um, so there's those types of issues, and they're not infallible. Pulling off the other part of this impossible mission, getting hold of Grant's thumbprint. Grant doesn't think we can covertly get a hold of his fingerprint. He's really suspicious every time Jamie or Adam comes over here. So I'm going to have him copy a stack of CDs, and hopefully that way we can get a hold of his fingerprint. He's going to come to the store in a minute. It's freaking me out. Carrie's turned double agent to try to spare Grant's phone, and a CD case may be the perfect foil. Remember how you said we couldn't covertly get your fingerprint? Easy as pie, but Grant's not amused. Yes, I told the producer yesterday that it would be almost impossible to covertly get my fingerprint. Apparently, I was wrong. We're expecting a double agent for you. Yeah, for my own team. <laughs> With the master print under wraps, Jamie successfully dusts it off. Look at that. Scans it in, and when he prints it onto acetate, he has one of those Heinemann moments of genius. As you can see here, the prints that we were getting are all kind of jaggy looking. It's not real clean lines. So I realized that I can go back in this scale with a marker and clean up these jaggies, and then we can shrink it back down. It's a fine line, but with both Jamie and Grant's prints cleaned up, first impressions are that this might just work. Dude, I think it's perfect. With their hopes raised, it's back to the edge. But in case you're thinking of trying this at home, maybe we've edited out one crucial step. So, sorry, but you can't. Jamie? Yeah, these are beautiful. Good. I think they're really, really good. Jamie makes new gel prints, and then it's all ready to test. This time, the computer doesn't reject it straight away. It reads it, reads it some more, and then... Access granted. Yay! We got it. Yes? Yes. Dude! He just made my day. With access granted on the computer, it's time to access Grant's super lock. But that's taking things to a whole new level. Welcome, Jamie. Hey! Success using a ballistics gel fingerprint, they beat the computer scanner. Welcome, Jamie. Hey! <laughs> that works. 
So next up is Grant's fingerprint lock that has his thumb as the master. To rise to the challenge, Adam's getting hot under the collar. He's fetched the edge of Grant's covertly obtained print and has made a latex copy that he's going to plant straight onto his warm, sweaty, pulsing thumb. Okay, so you guys ready? Yeah, we've been working on this for days, and I think we have a couple things that might work. Cool. Okay, well, I'll be here. All right. and tries again, but nothing. With this technique dribbling towards busted, Adam tries licking the latex. Hey, hey. And he's in. He has set off the next alarm, but the finger's been foiled. I don't care about the alarm. It works, man. No way. <laughs> that is latex glued to my thumb. But they're not stopping there. Well, that's one now. Shall we try uh, all of our other techniques? Next up, it's Jamie who's made a regular ballistics gel print of Grant's thumb. And guess what? Yay! Hey! Nicely done! <laughs> That's two for two! No way! <laughs> At this point, the one we bought for the computer is a lot harder to break than this one. Yeah. Well, I said we move on to the copy paper now. With everything they do working, the team goes for broke by trying the photocopy of Grant's print. No warmth and no pulse, just a lick piece of paper. <laughs> this is dark! What is this? Oh, there's your problem. <laughs> so the myth that fingerprint locks can't be foiled is busted. So, so biometrics suck. <laughs> Maybe not. I really think that biometrics have a, a lot of potential, and I think that's the, the way it's going to go, but the reality is, is can't think everything's foolproof. Biometrics are not a panacea that say we're going to fix our authentication problems with biometric uh, devices. So the reality is, is we rely on usernames and passwords, and we're going to for a period of time anyway until biometrics come down in cost and they get better, obviously, than, than what you saw there. But that, so with that in mind, I wanted to take a second to kind of go through a little process of showing you how to make a good password. What's a good password? It's one that's long, right? It's one that's different from site to site. It's one that you can remember easily, but that can't be easily guessed. And a lot of users have trouble doing that, figuring that out. So I think it's a really simple process if you put a little thought into it. So somebody give me a sentence with four, five, six words in it that you can remember, that you're not going to forget. Something other than motorcycles don't have doors. What I got. Say again? Correct horse battery test. Correct horse battery test. Okay. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to think about some kind of an algorithm. What's an algorithm? An al algorithm's an approach, a technique that you're going to apply to something in order to get, get what you want. So in this case, you could use the last letter of each word, you could use the first letter of each word, you could use the second letter of each word. The downside with using, say, the second letter or third or fourth or letter or something like that, if you have a word that's only two characters or you have an A or something like that. So if you use the first one or you use the last one, that's probably, probably going to be better off. So you can start out with something like C-H-B-T. So that's four characters. That's not very good as far as as that, and because of the way I write in block lettering, they're all uppercase. So the first, next thing you could do is you could say, well, let's alternate that. Let's go C, lowercase, capital C, lowercase H, capital B, lowercase T. So that's a little bit better. Now we're using, instead of 26 characters, we're using 40, 52 possible characters. You can make the T a plus sign. You can make the T a plus sign. You can make the B an A. That's another way you could, could do, could add some complexity. So let's go capital C, lowercase h, capital B, plus sign. Again, it's still four characters, but now we're including some additional characters, which again adds complexity. 
Something else, though, you want is you want a different password from one site to the next, right? Actually, before I get to that, let's do this. What happens after 30 days, 60 days, 90 days on a particular site? They make you change your password, right? It's annoying after a while. It's hard to keep up with your password. So you can add a number to increment. We're not going to leave this this way, but you don't want your last character to be the number that you increment. Because with a lot of automated tools, that that's what they do. When they think they identify something that they think is a password, they will start appending it with a number. And they'll increment that last digit automatically to check to see that you're incrementing a number for a password. So you don't want your last character to be that. But what this will allow you to do is to increment this number each time you're required to change a password. So in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, whenever you have to increment or have to change passwords, just change it to a number two. The rest of your password stays exactly the same. But we don't want this to be our last character either. And we still need a password that's different from site to site. So site name to it. Now you've got a significantly longer password. You've got one that's difficult to guess because of all the different types of characters. You've got a number in it that you can increment to keep track of to cycle through as far as your number of passwords. And this one's unique only to Facebook. For your Chase account, you replace Facebook with Chase. For, is there anybody on MySpace? Probably not. iTunes. Place it with iTunes. So you have a lot of different, you have a, a unique password, something that's easy to remember, but difficult to guess, and it's something that you can cycle through. So it's a good approach, I think, to, 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 to uh, managing your password, and making it a little bit easier, and adding a lot of security to your particular situation. Any question over, over that? Okay. So, you'll leave that here. Hold on. Did you figure it out? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, so, let's say we want to protect our data. We can protect our data in transit, as it's being uh, uh, sent between us and a bank. We want to protect that information, our login information, our account numbers, things like that. We also want to be able to protect our information at rest on our hard drives, things like that, on our, our tape backups. We lose a tape backup. If it's encrypted, hopefully that encryption can't be broken. It's protected. If it's not encrypted, obviously we lose it. All that data is gone. Encryption is used to render altered plain text, so the text that we can read and understand, into some type of cipher text. Something that's just a bunch of garbage, something that we can't, can't easily understand. The two main components of, of encryption are the algorithm and the key. The algorithm is, again, saying the first letter, oh, I erase it, the first letter of every word in the sentence, things like that, versus the key is the specific number, and I'll we'll get back to that here in just a second when we talk about this, this particular example. So the components, different types of algorithms, the RSA, which is one particular type of, of uh, encryption technique, DES, triple DES, both, so those are all different types of encryption, encryption schemes. There's also the key itself. Modern algorithms use either a single key, which is symmetric, or two keys, asymmetric encryption. When you see the S in symmetric, think same. Whether it's referring to encryption, it's referring to download and upload speeds, Regardless of when you hear it in computing, think symmetric, think same. When you hear symmetric, think same. So with symmetric key encryption, there's one key. It's a private key for, with both parties. So I've shared with you both the algorithm, which is a shift, and the key, which is 13. So the A becomes an N, et cetera, et cetera. So you figured out what that means, right? Does anybody else know what that is? How would anybody else in this room know what that is? I would have to share that with that other person, wouldn't I? So now I've got it shared with another person. Now I can't send him a private message anymore. If I sent, wanted to send him a private message, I'd have to have a different encryption key, a different encryption scheme. So one of the downsides to symmetric key encryption is managing all those keys. It becomes a problem. If I wanted to protect communications just in this room so that nobody outside could, could, could see those communications, I could share that key with everybody, 
But again, I couldn't share anything personally between me and one other person in the classroom. So key management becomes an issue. Also, getting you that key is an issue. I just handed you the sheet of paper, but what if you're in New York or London or Tokyo or something like that? I can't email it to you along with the message. Why? Because if I send the message and the algorithm and the key at the same time, you have access to it. Yes? You decrypt it first. How do you decrypt it? Exactly. You've got to get on the key first. It's referred to as an out-of-band communication. You've got to figure out a different way to get the algorithm and the key to them using a different means, a different method, a different mechanism. That's the shortcoming of, 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 of uh, symmetric key encryption. The advantage is it's very efficient for a computer to be able to encrypt, encrypt and decrypt. It's, it, it works much more efficiently than asymmetric encryption, which we'll talk about next. Asymmetric key encryption, sometimes referred to as public key encryption. There's two keys. There's a public key and there's a private key. So let's say private. Actually, I'm going to go back to this here in a second. Private and public. So what, what was the message? Caesar Cipher. Caesar Cipher. Julius Caesar used what he used a variety of different methods of, of uh, hiding communications between him and various people on the field. One of them was the shift cipher, Caesar, Caesar cipher. And it was simply shifting the letters down. In this case, I used 13, 13 characters, so that the A became an N, uh, B became O, C became Q, uh, P. So it was just simply a shift. So you end up with a message that's you know, really kind of difficult to look at. As far as encryption schemes go, that's pretty basic. Um, he actually used a variety of different techniques. In one case, he, he uh, uh, had someone where they, they didn't have, he had a message that didn't have to be there quickly, it just had to be kept uh, uh, between the, the, those two parties. And so he shaved the guy's head, put the message on the guy's scalp, let the hair grow back, and sent, sent the guy to his destination. When the guy was pulled aside, you know, in question, he didn't have the message, it was you know, hidden in his, in his, on a scalp. And because they didn't find any physical message on him, they didn't see any paper, papyrus, or whatever. Uh, there was no message to, to intercept. In another case, there was uh, uh, using a pole and using leather, you'd write the message out, you, you would wrap the leather around, as kind of a spiral uh, 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 method around the pole, write, it at, write your message across the pole, then you'd unravel it. Well, then it just looked like a bunch of garbage until you rewrap the, the pole with that particular piece of leather so that the letters all line up, then you can decipher and see what it meant. So, so that diff there are different ways that, that he went about doing it. The point is, is encryption's been around a very long time, and, and it, it's gotten certainly more complex, but there's been a lot of techniques over the years to, to encrypt messages. Uh, asymmetric key encryption, as I said, has two keys, right? A public key and a private key. The public key is out there for everybody to see. We post that to our website. We put it in email messages. It's located in directories. Private key, however, we keep private to ourselves. There's only one private key. We don't share it with anybody. It's only known by us. The relationship between these two keys is very important. What happens is if somebody wants to send this person a, a, an encrypted message or this person wants to send an encrypted message here, this key is used to encrypt the message and it gets sent over here. The way this works is the public key is the only key that will decrypt a message encrypted with the private key. What won't happen is this private key will not reverse that. This private key will not also decrypt that same message. The same with the, in reverse that is true as well. The public key, if a message is encrypted with the public key, the only key that will decrypt it is the private key, not the public key. So it's a one way, it works either way, but only one at a time. Does that make sense? The reason that that's important is it creates a situation where digital signatures become possible. If you want to send somebody a private message, you don't want anybody else to see it, you look up that person's public key, you encrypt the message with that public key, and you send it to that person. What happens if somebody else intercepts that message? They can't decrypt it because they don't have the private key. The public key won't decrypt it. 
They don't have the private key, so it doesn't mean anything to anybody else. But digital signatures allow the reverse of that to happen, too. If you want to verify that you really are who you say you are, you encrypt a message with your private key, which nobody else has. What's the only key that will decrypt it? The public key. Well, everybody has access to that. Everybody looks up your public key and says, the only person that's associated with that public key is that person with the private key. So it's a digital signature. It's a digital way to verify who the owner of that, that key is. <laughs> Stick, anybody heard of steganography? Steganography? It's related to encryption, and a lot of times it gets talked about in the same, same breath. It's slightly different, though. When you see an encrypted message, you know you, there's a message there, right? You might not know what it says. It may or may not be English, but you know there's something there. With steganography, steganography hides some kind of a message within a message. You don't know that it's there. It's hidden. You're not aware that there's even a message, message present. So in this example, these two images are one and the same. You get one image embedded in another. You just simply can't see it when they're combined. I actually created an example for, for class. This website will see if it comes up. A really highly secure password. Browse the file with that, that cat there. Type in my password. And it timed out. Yeah, well, it worked yesterday. I said an ATC presentation is what it said. It did work yesterday. It did work. It worked twice yesterday. <laughs> Um, what it does is it open, opens up that file and, and shows you the text that I saved in, into it, which was ATC presentation. Um, Key as you can. The longer the better. The longer it is, the more time it will take. 
use access control. In other words, look at the MAC addresses that are logging into that wireless access point and lock it down to those MAC addresses. Is that, is that a, a perfect solution? Are there ways around it? Yes, but it's better than nothing. Yeah, it makes it more difficult for somebody to get onto your network. Take advantage of it. Do site surveys. People like the idea of site surveys. They just don't like how tedious they are because they involve setting up a wireless access point, getting out some kind of a signal string for you, even if it's just your laptop, and walking around every few feet taking measurements. Is this a good signal? Is it not a good signal? That gets really tedious. You move the access point, you've got to do all that over again. So it gets really tedious, but it does two things. People associate it with indicating the coverage, right? We want to make sure we have coverage in all the rooms of our house, all the rooms in the facility. That's, that's what most people think about. What they don't think about is... It also indicates leakage. How far are those signals going outside of the walls? The further they go out, the more of a security risk that that is. So for example, here we've got three different buildings, and we've got the theoretical coverage of a wireless access point with indoor coverage. In other words, that's it should be getting that kind of coverage indoors. I looked up the, the, the uh, the coverage, theoretical coverage of a, a 802.11g in indoors and as well as outdoors. What you don't see is the outdoor coverage was out here. So if we were, were broadcasting without any walls, the coverage would be much, much greater. So the reality is, is our signal is probably somewhere out here. That means that if there's a street over here or there's a street down here, somebody potentially pulls up, sits there and bangs away at our network for as long as they want to they don't have to physically enter our facility. So that's a problem. Now, yesterday in the class, somebody asked a really good question. They asked uh, if there's any way to control that signal. And yes, there are some ways to control that signal. You can use a Faraday cage, which may or may not be a, a practical use. Anybody heard of a Faraday cage? What that means? It's basically a, a, a mechanism to block signals. You can do it with chicken wire. If, you, if you've got a house that's being built, it's much easier. If you've got a facility that's being built, it's much easier to implement something like that. You just put it in the walls. Now, the downside to that is it's going to block your other signals as well. So you're probably not going to get real good cell phone coverage inside of your, your facility. But it's going to stop your radio signals from your, your uh, wireless signal from going outside of, the, uh, of, the, of that area. Other mechanisms are some wireless access points have the ability to turn down the signal, to reduce the signal so it's not broadcasting as far as it normally would. You don't find that in every router. It depends on the router, or excuse me, every uh, wireless access point. It depends on the access points and the features that it has built into it. That is an option in some cases. So you can, within the settings, reduce the range using that type of feature. So, kind of conclude things up. I, I said go to Tarleton here. Um, go to school. Go anywhere. Again, you want to defend yourself from those types of issues of, of outsourcing and stuff like that. The best way to do that is get educated, get certifications. Don't, just because you get that certification and you graduate, you're not done. You've got to periodically go back and retool, retrain, and stay on top of things. Be a, CI, be a CIS major. Go to Tarleton. Go to, to UNT. Go anywhere. But you know, I think information technology is just a, a really interesting field to be in. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I was talking to you the other day. I, I don't believe that there's an expert in information systems. It's too broad of a field. You can know an awful lot about one thing and talk to it and be an expert. You can talk to another expert in information systems and basically not be able to communicate because it's such a broad field. You, you, just, you can't know everything about it. Uh, think security. It's a big, hot field right now. It's been a hot field for the last few years. It's going to continue to get that way. You have a lot of state-sponsored terrorism, state-sponsored hacking. It's, it's a priority for not only the, the government, but also for corporations to be able to protect themselves from corporate espionage, espionage and stuff like that. So, uh, other than that, the advice I could give you, anybody heard of VirtualBox? Download VirtualBox. Uh, play with that, play with various flavors of Linux, backtrack, things like that. Uh, play with the virtual box, that way it's a nice, safe environment. Uh, if something happens, blow it away and load up another virtual machine. So, yeah, I think that's
that's the best way to get familiar with stuff like that is, is to play with it and break it and fix it. Any questions? That's all i got for you today. Thank you very much. Uh, if you are interested, I do have a few little goodies up here if you're interested in. Um, I think there's uh, some uh, cups and stuff like that and pens, but uh, you're welcome to it if you're not interested.